Imagine if Earth had access to a limitless source of clean and sustainable energy. A source that could be easily captured and stored until it was needed. As the Earth's population grows, there is an urgent need to reduce our reliance on depleting natural resources and find an alternative source of power. In the UK, a team of 12 universities have been investigating whether the first element, hydrogen, could be just the alternative energy carrier we've been looking for. Hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, never mind on, on Earth. It's the, the, the fuel of stars. We're all made from hydrogen, one way or another. Uh, so the fir first thing to grasp is that there's plenty of it about. One of the things that's unique about hydrogen is if you're thinking about energy production, if you burn hydrogen, then your only product is water. Now, if you burn something like natural gas, not only do you get water, but you only get, also get carbon dioxide produced. The project's bringing together partners from all across the UK, for, from Wales, Scotland, uh, and most areas of England. Uh, within that grouping, we have a, a range of activities. So from London and Cardiff, for instance, we have people looking at socio-economic aspects of hydrogen. What would a hydrogen economy, to use that term, uh, look like? Then we have other groups working on technical aspects, producing hydro some producing hydrogen from waste, some produ looking at producing hydrogen from excess uh, intermittent renewables. And we have others working on uh, associated technical areas, so the liquefaction of hydrogen, and also for separating hydrogen from uh, mixtures of gases that you sometimes get from um, processing biogas and, and similar things. Fossil fuels may have propelled us through the Industrial Revolution, but they're expensive, unsustainable, and not always conveniently supplied to small and remote communities. And whilst renewables provide a source of sustainable energy, the use of hydrogen could enable the development of a far more reliable, efficient and sustainable energy network. There's a, a particularly large issue surrounding wind energy. When the wind's not blowing, we can't have the lights going out. So we need ways of storing energy, and this is where hydrogen uh, comes to the fore. Storing gas as energy is something we know how to do. It's something we've done for a very long time. And although the name hydrogen is uh, new to some people as a, as a major energy carrier. In fact, it isn't. Uh, we know how to produce gas, we know how to store it, we know how to distribute it, and we know how, how to do it safely. In the early 2000s, around uh, 2003, 2004, um, there was a very high peak of, um, of, of expectations within the sort of scientific and policy community internationally um, around hydrogen. There was a lot of discussion about the idea of a hydrogen economy. Um, and in fact, even uh, President Bush at the time, um, in one of his State of the Nation speeches, talked about hydrogen as a uh, you know, great new energy source and um, linked that to ideas about energy independence in, in, in the US. Um, in, the U in, in, in the UK and Europe, um, expectations around hydrogen have been much more geared towards um, issues around low carbon and dealing with the challenge, the systemic challenge of, 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 of climate change. Unlike other gases, hydrogen can't simply be drilled for or taken from the atmosphere, but must be liberated from more chemically complex sources. Luckily, it can be produced from a multitude of sources, but these must be carefully considered to ensure the process remains clean and sustainable. The sources we typically look to capitalise on are things that are uh, waste, I suppose, or, or, or currently not being used. So this brings in waste oils, uh, it brings in landfill gas potentially, that can be converted into hydrogen if you want to do that. And in places like Scotland, perhaps the northeast of England, Wales even, where we're set to have very substantial amounts of excess electricity as a result of the intermittency of renewables, uh, then it makes a lot of sense to look at electrolyzing water. Hydrogen production is very easy. What's really difficult is separating hydrogen from the other products. Hydrogen tends not to produ be produced as the, as the sole product. So the difficult thing about hydrogen production is actually getting pure hydrogen. Current steam reforming methods predominantly used to produce pure hydrogen are energy intensive and inefficient. But researchers at Newcastle University have developed a cleaner, more efficient version of the steam reforming process that uses less energy and produces a separated stream of pure hydrogen. Steam methane reforming is a process that has been developed essentially to work at large scale. 
it requires a very significant capital investment. It's a very complicated process. It's got lots of different stages, the hydrogen production and the separation. What we're trying to do at Newcastle is look at process intensification. Process intensification is about doing things with less capital investment. Um, so it's about, it's, it's about removing and getting rid of some of those units. So what we're trying to do is produce hydrogen within a reactor and then in situ separate that hydrogen or separate the carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide that it's, that it's produced with at the same time so we can actually drive the, process, drive the reaction forward so we're not limited by equilibrium and also perform a separation at the same time. So the idea is we're trying to do it with effectively one unit and not a reformer, two shift reactors and a pressure swing adsorption stage. So in our particular case we're looking at uh, oxygen containing materials and the idea is we take a reducing gas, so that's a gas that will remove oxygen from the solid, so that, re that, that gas is effectively, in, uh, in, in this particular case, methane, our fuel. We reduce the oxide material in the presence of methane to produce a reduced oxygen carrier and carbon monoxide and hydrogen, um, which is often referred to as syngas in the chemical industry, which is in itself is a useful stream. But then with that reduced oxygen carrier, we then reoxidize that, not with air, but with water. What that does is that produces hydrogen in that, state, in, in that step and then and reoxidizes the material. So overall, we have a reforming process that produces hydrogen and syngas. But separate streams of hydrogen and syngas, so we have a pure stream of hydrogen produced from the water there. Now the really interesting thing about that is we can actually, instead of having a, a two-phase process where we have a reduction in methane and a reoxidation in water, we can actually have a three-stage process where we have a reduction in methane, a reoxidation in water that produces hydrogen, which we stop and then finish the oxidation in air. And that actually puts energy into the system, so overall the process is autothermal and we don't need to burn methane or natural gas in the conventional sense uh, in addition to the process that, that that methane is combusted within the looping cycle. Researchers at Newcastle University have also stepped beyond the traditional steam reforming to develop simple ceramic membranes that can be used to separate pure streams of hydrogen from syngas. It's interesting because the membranes really have a parallel idea to the, the to looping. Again, we have a feed stream which is a natural gas feed stream on one side of the membrane and a water feed stream on the other side of the membrane. And we have a material which is actually very similar to the oxygen carrying material but in this particular case, um, it serves as an oxygen permeation membrane. On the water side, the driving force for the reforming reaction causes the water to split. Oxygen is transported across the membrane. The oxygen oxidizes the methane to produce syngas again in a, a, actually a two to one hydrogen CO ratio, which is particularly suitable for methanol production. On the other side of the membrane, we have a pure hydrogen stream that's produced. So again, we've got a reaction taking place and we've got in situ separation. A particularly interesting uh, outcome potential uh, can be found in the work done at the University of Leeds uh, where they've taken a range of waste oils and other materials, some which are particularly intractable to deal with uh, using normal chemical processing and they're using these as the basis for producing hydrogen from. Um, uh, one of the uh, researchers who's uh, looking at conversion of uh, carbonaceous sources to hydrogen and I'm using uh, advanced steam reforming processes to do this. It's the most common process of hydrogen production in the world and uh, currently it uses natural gas as a source. But what I do is that I use renewable feedstocks or sustainable feedstocks to make uh, the production of hydrogen. Over the course of the years I've been researching this process, we've been using waste cooking oil for instance, so straight from uh, our refectory from the university. We've also been using uh, crude glycerol, which is a byproduct of the production of biodiesel. Um, we've also been using um, urea, because it's kind of a, a precursor of, uh, of urine. <laughs> and um, waste lubricant oil. If you compare the waste lubricant oil with the fresh lubricant oil, then you can see that they are very different. Um, and also we've been using pyrolysis oils, and that's an example of pyrolysis oil. It comes from converting solid biomass from pine wood into um, 
condensable volatiles which become an oil like this. We don't rely on external heating to, for the reformer. We provide the heat by oxidizing of the, uh, of the catalyst, which is an, what we call an exothermic reaction. It generates heat. And this heats up the whole reactor very nicely, very evenly. In addition to that, another aspect of the process I look at is that inside the reformer, um, we place a material that is able to capture the carbon dioxide produ produced. And this is very uh, important because it allows not only to make a purer product, but it has a knock-on effect on all the intermediate reactions that lead to the production of hydrogen. So this means that you, we can, in a single reactor, have a very high purity hydrogen um, product which doesn't rely on external heating and therefore doesn't have all these um, stages which are non-efficient in the overall production of, of hydrogen process. The purity of the feedstock as well means that we are not only eliminating the carbon types of pollution which contribute to climate change, etc., but also those that uh, have to do with smog formation, you know, the nitrogen oxides, for instance, or, um, or the acid rain and acid deposition, which comes from the sulfur components of the feedstock. So this means that we are dealing with a very, very clean energy vector. But as hydrogen technologies such as these become more sophisticated, why aren't we seeing more hydrogen produced for our energy needs? At the moment, most hydrogen um, that's used commercially um, is um, used in industrial processes. Um, it's produced from steam methane reforming, some of it's produced from large-scale um, electrolysis, um, and it's used in industry. Um, the question really is, is, is how that um, moves out of becoming a niche industrial product um, and becomes a mainstream energy carrier. And there I think there are a couple of, 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 of potential markets. One is obviously in transport and um, potential use in, in hydrogen vehicles. Um, there there's very clear advantages over existing competing technologies, particularly in relation to long range. Um, and I think that we will see over the next five to ten years, um, you know, vehicles commercially available and beginning to hit the market. The other, the other potential um, market is in relation to um, renewable energy systems and the issue about intermittency um, and there hydrogen has a clear role to play as an energy storage um, vector um, which allows you to sort of smooth out many of the problems you have in terms of um, excess capacity when the wind blows very hard if you have a lot of wind power um, or when the sun shines very brightly if you have a lot of solar power for example on your system um, it allows you to um, smooth out the peaks and troughs um, because you can you can um, easily convert that excess renewable electricity into hydrogen and then um, feed that back into the to the grid um, so there's, there's two really um, competing markets, if you like, where, where we would expect hydrogen to emerge over the next decade, one in relation to low carbon transport and the other in relation to um, the development of um, a renewable based um, low carbon electricity system. In the UK, there's a whole range of things going on and most of them are demonstration projects. There's Eco Island, for example, on the Isle of Wight. There are trials like the London Black Cab taxi trial that was done during the Olympics. Um, I'd hate to single out too many and miss out so many others that are out there, but these things are occurring at the national level in certain places and they're happening typically in London as, as a sort of world city where you've got a window on the world where the advertising and commercialising and saying here we've got something to show is very strong. But also you're seeing it in places that are islands, as I say, the Isle of Wight, the Outer Hebrides, for example, have also um, done some trials with uh, the Royal Mail sometime in the past with uh, prototyping a vehicle that was running on hydrogen fuel cells. So there are different contexts. They tend to be led by cities, big city regions, but also islands where there is a need for lower cost and, and more renewable options. Um, and people are saying, well, as a storage technique, hydrogen fuel cells perfect for us. It could be the future. A lot of the, the technology that we have um, available um, uh, today is, is in place. You could, you could make systems work with it, um, but it's too, still too far, far too expensive. So we need to bring down the cost. Um, and then secondly, the, 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 the challenge is really about ensuring that the sources of hydrogen um, that we um, develop um, 
are, are truly sustainable and are genuinely green, if you like. Um, and there again, um, as the work of the, the broader consortium has shown, we have a, 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 a wide portfolio of potential technologies that could be brought on stream. And that's one of the key sources, we, key strengths of hydrogen, really, is this diversity. There are many different ways of producing hydrogen sustainably. In many ways, the UK is in a fantastic position. It's got excellent research facilities. It's got excellent links between those research facilities and industry. What it lacks, if you like, is a coherent vision at the national level. It doesn't have a champion for hydrogen and fuel cells. And it needs somebody at governmental level, at the national level, because there are certain national, uh, regional uh, initiatives that are taking place. But at the national level, if you had a champion, that could really make a difference for hydrogen and fuel cells. What's really missing in the UK is that national coordinated approach. Um, and when we compare that to other, other leading countries, um, we certainly need to see more coordinated action um, at a UK national level, um, bringing together public-private partnerships to actually drive forward in a coordinated way with clear national long-term objectives, the development of the technology. Hydrogen as a part of our everyday lives may be a few years off, but as research into the delivery of sustainable hydrogen continues, it has significant potential to form a solid foundation of our energy future. Different technologies are all competing against each other, and in renewables, one of a key technology, hydrogen and fuel cells, is storage. And if we can crack storage technically, and if we can crack clean hydrogen in the way that the consortium is trying to crack, this makes game-changing uh, it's a game changer potentially for this particular area of, of energy. The success of that sort of critical mass of, of, of researchers has, has resulted in the next generation of these supergen projects where a number of the key members in uh, this one, which is about to finish, are moving on into the, in, into the next generation. So we're expecting that not only have we created a, ne a network and a critical mass of researchers, but that will be continued into the future. And I, I think that's particularly uh, important uh, and very useful.